Teskerma, Tronona, my good evening. Shaw by a column scarf. I may cope with a forest negadica, a column kill ye. A proche takia, garlic ne hayden, a scarlet ne hollopper. I'm working for forest negadica with a column kill ye, a project or a partnership which links Gaelic Ireland with Scotland. And I've been asked to say something about Gaelic ne hollopper. Uh, Scottish, but Scottish Gaelic. So there's a lot to discover, and I can't cover it all in 30 to 40 minutes, but I will look at some of the questions and some developments that have shaped the situation of Scottish Gaelic today. I won't have all the answers. This is the first time I've tried to do something or record something on Zoom, so there may be a few glitches or awkward pauses. Uh, I apologize in advance. When we, I'd also perhaps at this stage, I'll try and slayer, share a slide. Um, when we think about a Gaelic, we may well think, we may well think, what should we do? A Gaelic, a Gaelic, a Gaelic, a Gaelic. It's about Ireland or from being from Ireland, what else is there? We can forget about Gaelic Nahalapan or a Gaelic. In a way, it's like a sibling we've got separated from at birth, perhaps we've never met, uh, but still very much alive and worth getting to knowing, getting to know. I'd like to start with a little bit of geography or orientation. Where is this place, the Scottish Gaelic is spoken for a start? Well, we hear a lot about, since the Belfast Agreement, about east-west, north-south relations. Scotland uh, sounds, yeah, sounds like east-west, put it with east-west. Or if you go uh, east from the Sperrins uh, or, uh, or Belfast even, uh, well, you have hit Scotland all right. Now, if you go north from Tyrone, north of the Sperrins uh, or, uh, or Belfast, what is there? Is it just sea? Uh, is it just sea? and salt ice, the Faroe Islands, the North Pole. What is there? Well, one of the strange things is that Scotland is both to the east of us and also to the north. The maps we see often hide uh, our relationship between Ireland and Scotland. So the map you see here uh, is uh, a sheer column kill. The photography, cartography is accurate. It's by Collins Bartholomew, well-known cartographers. You can buy it, if you wish so wish, from on Catapoli, on, uh, and all good bookshops at Catapoli also have it online. But the map is framed in a different way uh, to the weather forecast you see on BBC or perhaps RTE. Uh, the blue arrow in the bottom left uh, sh uh, shows north. If you travel from uh, east, from Toronto, uh, uh, east from, you come to Scotland, uh, as, as we've said before, east. But if you travel uh, due north, you'll also come to Scotland, hitting the Hebrides and the west, and also the west coast of Scotland. You may be able to make out areas of mountains, uh, and of course you can. Uh, you probably have a mental picture of the highlands of Scotland that which go on and on and on and are some and are on a scale. Uh, we don't really have here. And uh, this is known as Thrym, Thrym Alupin, the ridge or back, backbone of Scotland. Uh, the, uh, and they separate the east of Scotland, Aberdeen and Murray with, you no, know, there's very good land from the west. And there's just one corridor uh, from west to east or east to west. That's the Great Glen and Glan Mord and Loch Ness. It's a route that Colin Killer travelled when he visited the King of the Picts. And today there's a good road, there's, there's also a canal um, and a, a railway. And of course, you could travel up the, uh, the loch as well. Well, when the mountains uh, divide uh, Scotland, travel by uh, water was relatively and easy, and relatively common perhaps into the middle of that uh, uh, century, much more than it, uh, so than it is now. 
uh, with fishing boats, coast to coast, puffers, uh, uh, coasters, etc. And there's another image uh, which we use on the website, columnkida.org, which is uh, worth looking at. It's also the background here, uh, which has a different orientation. And you see, and this I think makes it easier to see, easier to see the Lochan of Mata and in Chiri, uh, the sea locks and inland locks, the Scottish spelling there. Uh, they're more obvious. So, of course, Scotland has a tremendous, very, very long coastline. Uh, which, uh, which, uh, and uh, the locks allow you, sea locks allow you to, uh, uh, to go away inland by water to areas that will be hard to reach over the mountains. Some of the inch, uh, inshore locks also like Loch Nish or Loch Awe, which is now Gael, our Loch Lomond, also go on for many miles. So travel by water could be easier uh, than by land. So it's not surprising. And you can sort of see how the Irish monks could spread out different parts uh, of, of, of Scotland, uh, of this, of this, uh, of the, of the coast. There's in some areas like our guy, there's more dedications to Irish saints than in, our, in Ireland as well. Of course, you know, Ireland has, uh, Ulster has, uh, there are sea lochs as, as, as well in, in Ireland. Uh, but perhaps in terms of Scotland, what made travel easier was the great river basins, the foil basins, the ban, and also the Aaron Shannon, the gallo glasses, or people traveling from between Ireland and Scotland uh, uh, for many centuries used these river systems. You could think of the hundreds and hundreds of gallo glasses that came with Agnes Campbell, wife of Thurla Lunya Honiel, to places like Porton Long and the Foyle. And there were traders as well as gallo glasses. The Foyle uh, river system is tidal as far as Claddy on the Finn. And there were Gaelic speakers settled uh, and at Claddy in the middle of the seven, uh, 17th century. Uh, and uh, uh, so when people came from Scotland later, uh, uh, they, they really knew it's, it's a continuous thing. It wasn't, it wasn't just plantation. It's, it's something that's been going on for centuries and uh, strong in the medieval period. The West of Scotland has uh, had as as a, a, an amazing number of manuscripts and stories and poetry coming from Roscommon and uh, perhaps with the, uh, associated with the Gallic glasses and along the Shannon Erdan River systems, Scottish and Irish Gaelic shared a cultural world from early medieval into uh, uh, early modern times. So, well, as we're talking about geography, uh, there's one thing we shouldn't perhaps forget this final map is uh, from uh, Canada, and it shows the east of, uh, of, um, of Canada, all of Nua, Nua, or Nova Scotia, and Cape Breton. We're coming up there to the, to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, and you can also see um, <coughs> Newfoundland uh, uh, in the right-hand corner. So in, in the late 1800s, Gaelic, was the third most spoken language in Canada after French and English. There was a Gaelic newspaper, Mactalwa, which linked the Scot Scottish Gaelic speakers in Canada, wherever they were, they were, were some, a few in the prairies or, and often quite remote settlements, and, but as well as towns like uh, Toronto and, uh, and places like New Brunswick. And there's a very significant uh, publishing industry a larger publishing industry really in Canada uh, in the late, at the end of the 19th century than in Scotland itself in, in Gaelic. There still are a few hundred uh, uh, native speakers of Gaelic left, uh, perhaps older even than me. And what was also new is there's, there's a revival, important is there's, a, there's a, 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 a very significant revival which is closely bound up with the older native speakers. There have been very good recordings and collections from the 1960 onwards, and these are available online. Uh, but also learners have associated with the Gaelic uh, speakers 
they've modeled their languages on theirs, they'd be they befriended them. Uh, it's not like banks that have entirely died out, uh, but uh, and uh, it it so the revival is often in, in rural uh, uh, rural settings. Um, there's a very good museum, a community museum uh, that is part and also part of the community. Uh, there's nothing quite like it in Ireland, and you have Cayleys traditional gallings. Uh, you have what's called milling or or beating or beating woolen uh, uh, woolen uh, cloth. Alour as a, as a Gaelic name. So it's a different landscape and there are different features. Uh, obviously the landscape is different, there's, there's a lot of forest. Uh, the culture uh, was uh, slightly different. Step dancing survived uh, in a way it didn't in Scotland. The clergy in Scotland weren't keen on dancing. Some of the clergy in Ireland weren't keen on dancing either, uh, but they didn't have the same clout in the backwoods of Scotland and uh, step dancing survived and this sort of being reintroduced uh, in Gaelic Scotland by people like Joy Dumnop. Uh, and uh, there there's a, a... so one another question um, we could ask Gaelic Nahaden, I guess Gaelic Nahalopan, Gaelic Nahaden, because Gaelic Nahalopa are the one language or two. People can get a bit aroused about that. Whether uh, so, Changawain no Yahanga no better slyre the Hanuinti, one language or two, or perhaps a chain of dialects. There are some real differences, and one of these, I suppose, is the, uh, if, you, if you focus on a particular difference, is, the, is between the future. And the, uh, is is, a, is the the way they frame the future and present tense in Irish? Uh, uh, you have here. Gian Madi, I found Gian Madi. I found the he. So uh, Madi uh, uh, reads all night, uh, and that could would probably mean every night. She regularly reads all night. And you also say, Yeah, he Madi, I found the he Madi will read throughout the night tonight. That means tonight, so that future tense, future orientation. Now in Scotland, there's only one way of saying this. I, it is, um, uh, Navy, Navy Madi, Cotton Hee. And you have to know the context to see whether that actually means. Uh, uh, is the future or a bit your tense? You have to know the text. Uh, 